Welcome to this Wednesday evening service and thank you for joining me today. You know, this Wednesday, I love to just have a moment of prayer with you, but specifically for two things. I'd like to pray, first of all, for the healing for precious people. You know, I know my own brother, John, he's a younger brother, uh, and uh, he, he's been in the hospital with COVID, and he's, thank you, Lord, doing better, but it's been quite a mighty fight. And, you know, people that don't have the faith that we have, that we have a healer who's at the Father's right hand, who forgiveth all our iniquities and heal our di- all our diseases. You know, we could call upon his name who is worthy to be praised. So shall be, we be saved, the scripture says. Saved means made whole or complete. It's not just the freedom from sin that would bind us, but sickness that would afflict us, you know. My father used to say that forgiveness and healing go hand in hand and it's so true like David says in Psalm 103, 103, who forgiveth all my iniquities and heals all my diseases. And you know, it is so wonderful to have that faith. But there are many people out there that don't know this faith. They don't know to call upon the name of Jesus. They don't know where to go for help when they are struggling physically and have maybe no encouragement that they're gonna make it or not. But we have an encouragement that despite it may feel hopeless and despite we may not feel we're coming through, we have faith. And faith brings what we are hoping for and is invisible into reality in our lives, you know, and we begin to experience that which is impossible, which is possible with God. What am I trying to say to you with this? Those people out there need our prayers. They need our prayers. You know, I remember in the scripture that the days when God was restoring his people in the days of Hezekiah, and and people had gone through a horrible time under his father's rulership, who was very into God and and into all kinds of evil. Shows you what a miracle God can bring about, you know, that Hezekiah, because he had such a godly mother, who uh, was the, the daughter of a priest, called Zechariah and she had must have had a tremendous difficult time being married to such an ungodly man but she never gave up her faith and believed and got rewarded and honored her faith by giving her a son called Hezekiah who really was a restorer I mean God, people began to worship again and he had a Passover you'll read it in the scripture but the priests had not set themselves apart unto God, so the blessing could not come because they were not holy. You know, in other words, it was held back because of them. And Hezekiah prayed and said, Lord, forgive them that they've not set themselves apart and please have mercy and forgive the people. And the Bible says, and healing began to come. In other words, God began to show the mercies of His forgiving grace by restoring health to the people. I'm not saying here, but I don't, you know, some people turn that around and then they say, oh, so you mean I am not forgiven because I'm sick? No, don't turn it around. Keep it in the right order. That God shows His mercy and His love by healing us and we're under His mercy and love. And so I pray together with you, let's pray together for the first thing here. Father, let your healing power come over this nation and over the nations of the earth. Let the people again be reminded that we have a merciful high priest, Jesus, at your right hand, ever living to intercede for us. And we pray for people that don't know you by faith, that you will restore health to them and that you, Father, spare their lives to be saved, that you bring the gospel to them by those who will share it with them. Let us be those people that share your love and kindness with others. But I pray today for healing to flow like a river right now to every person watching. Healing flow in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. The second thing I would like us to pray before we open the scripture today is that, you know, there's, uh, there's the nations need leadership. Our nation here in Britain, we have Boris Johnson as the prime minister and so forth. And, and they need God's help. Many times we maybe 
look at the news and can have our opinions about how things could or should be or you know or appreciate how they are but but we all don't always remember to pray but the scripture teaches us that we should pray for those who are in authority and in government and not just for our nation there are many nations today that really need our prayers. Things that are happening in the United States right now can so affect what's gonna happen in the world. And it's so important that we pray, Father, hallow your name. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so with this in mind, join me in prayer, would you? Father, we join together in faith for your grace. You put people in authority. In the book of Daniel, you say that it is by your decree that man rules on earth and that you place people in authority and take people out of authority. And I pray for your grace over Boris Johnson here in this nation, especially with all the Brexit negotiations and everything that's happening. Father, that your provident hand is upon us, even if we're unaware of it. Lord, you work by your hand through Darius, you work through your hand through Nebuchadnezzar and so many others who ruled who were themselves were unaware that it was by your spirit that they succeeded. It was by your spirit that they were guided. It was by your spirit that they prospered in what they did. And I pray that grace of your spirit on Boris Johnson and on the on the negotiations concerning Brexit and on the guidance for all of these things that affect so many businesses in our country and so so many people's well-being concerning how they can live here or live in Europe, Lord. I pray your grace, Father, upon all of this and all the fishermen and the fishers' rights and everything that's involved with all these negotiations. Northern Ireland, Lord, Southern Ireland and the other islands. I pray your grace over the over this situation, Father. Let your divine providence come over this, Lord. Oh, Father, I pray for America that you guide the future of that nation. And Father, that you guide the future of the nations of the earth, Lord. You know it so well. You have it all planned and prepared. And we thank you that despite that things seem maybe tumultuous, we can have faith in you. You calm the storm. You silence the winds, Lord. You command the way ahead. I thank you for this grace, Lord, that we can have courage and faith today to know that you are guiding us ahead and that you, Father, anoint people to go into government, Father, good Christian, godly, God-fearing men and women that they'll go into government in whatever nations to help direct the future of the nations in your will and purpose. And we thank you for this in Jesus' anointed name. Amen. You know, friends, it's so good to pray. There's so much power in prayer. Don't go by your feelings when you pray, but go by faith in God. Because he, Jesus, he teaches us to pray to our Father in secrets. Because what he sees in secret, he rewards in public. There is always an answer to prayer. And I'm so grateful I grew up with a praying mother and a praying father who were examples to us that prayer can change everything. Everything. I'll never forget I had an ear infection. And I sat in my mother's lap when I was a young boy. I think at that time I was maybe six years old. So I still remember it today. I sat in my mom's lap crying with the pain. And my father was gone. We had no car, no telephone. It was 1965. You know, there was nothing she could do but to just pray. You see, when people have no other options, they may be turned to prayer. But folks, I, I would suggest don't don't make God your last option, make him your first option. And my mother prayed and prayed and prayed for me and she sang and worshiped God while I fell asleep on her lap and I woke up the next morning and the pain was gone. When I was a young boy, I had warts all over my hands. I mean, really bad, big warts. And they were all over my hands. And so I was really mocked at school as a young boy, as a four, five, six-year-old, probably five-year-old, six-year-old boy, I was really mocked. And nobody, when you would run around or hold hands, would hold my hands and so forth. And everybody made fun of me. And I'll never forget, I came home to my mom. And I said, Mom, they're making fun of me because of my hands. Could you please pray that Jesus take these words away? <laughs> and my mom had faith. And I had faith that she had faith. 
because he had always prayed in faith. Oh, parents, I want to encourage you to be an example to your children in prayer. And my mama prayed for my hands and the next morning I woke up and all the words were gone. Seriously, they were gone. Jesus took them away. And I know miracles come like that and sometimes they come over time, but they always do come. If you stay in faith, stay in faith. You say, but Pastor, I feel nothing when I pray and I see nothing. Stay in faith. Hold on to faith. It has a great reward if you hold on to it and it will carry you through to the miracle. Today, I want to talk to you about the invisible becoming visible. And I'd like to take you to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And I'll read to you there verse 16 out of these different translations that I have here with you. The title of today's message is The Invisible Visible. Invisible becomes visible. Without controversy, 1 Timothy 3.16, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received in glory. I'll read the, in the, that was the New King James. Now I'll read it in the Amplified. And great and important and weighty, we confess, is the hidden truth, the mystic secret of godliness. He, God, was made visible in human flesh, justified, vindicated in the Holy Spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Passion translation, one more. For the mystery of righteousness, or as we would say here, godliness, is truly amazing. He was revealed as a human being and as our great high priest in the spirit. Angels gazed upon him as a man. And the glorious message of his kingly rulership is being preached to the nations. Many have believed in him and he has been taken back to heaven and has ascended into the place of exalted glory in the heavenly realm. Yes, great is the mystery of righteousness. I like the word godliness, the mystery of godliness. God was made manifest in the flesh, you see. I want to read you Colossians 1, verse 15, please, from the Amplified. Now he, talking about Jesus, is the exact likeness of the unseen God, the invisible, the visible representation of the invisible. He is the firstborn of all creation. Jesus is the visible representation of the invisible God. God became manifest in the flesh. And I want to just take you for a moment by having you look at Jesus, you see, because if we want to know what God looks like, all we have to do is look at Jesus. Anybody who says, well, how can I ever see God? Look at Jesus and you see him. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 7, if you, have seen, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And now you know him and now you see him. And then Thomas says, well, show us, Lord. And Jesus said to him, uh, to Philip, said to Philip, Philip, don't you know that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You see, Jesus, it says here in John 1 verse 18, came forth from the bosom of the Father. It says, no man has ever seen God at any time, the only unique Son or the only begotten God who's in the bosom or the intimate presence of the Father. He has declared Him. He has revealed him and brought him out where he can be seen. He has interpreted him. He has made him known. And I find this so important, dear friends, so that we don't have any mystic confusion. You know, in other words, it's, it's a mystery. So because it's a mystery, we can get caught up in 
mystery, but God makes everything clear and plain without any doubt of the truth and reality of it in Jesus. He is the fullness of the invisible God in human flesh. He was made manifest to help us find the only true living God. There is absolutely no question if anybody says, well, how can you know who God is or how can you see God? Well, listen to this verse. Listen to this. This is Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. He, talking about Jesus, is the sole expression of the glory of God, the light being, the outraying or radiance of the divine. He is the perfect imprint and very image of God's nature, upholding, maintaining, and guiding and propelling the universe by His mighty word of power. When He, by offering Himself, accomplished the cleansing of our sins and riddance of guilt and fully cleared our record and then sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He is the sole expression of the glory of God, the light being, the outrain, the radiance of the divine. Oh, it makes me want to look to Jesus and see my heavenly Father and His great love and His great mercy and His great goodness. The Lord is so wonderful. I've got just one more verse here. First John chapter 5, verse 20. Listen to this. And we have seen and know and positively and know positively that the Son of God has actually come to this world and has given us understanding and insight progressively to perceive, recognize and come to know better and more clearly Him who is true. That means the Heavenly Father. And we are in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, this man is the true God and He is eternal life. And John explains this. This is, of course, one of the last verses of his five chapters of 1 John and he explains it constantly in his letters. You know, he starts his letter by, with the same way that he finishes. He starts his letter by saying, I'm writing you about the word of life in him who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard, whom we have seen with their own eyes, and we have gazed upon for ourselves and have touched with their own hands. And the life, the aspect of his being was revealed, made manifest, demonstrated, and we saw as eyewitnesses and are testifying to and declare to you the life, the eternal life in him who already existed with the Father and who actually was made visible, was revealed to us, his followers. What we have seen and ourselves heard what we, is what we are telling you, so that you too may realize and enjoy fellowship as partners and partakers with us. And this fellowship that we have, which is the distinguishing mark of Christians, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I love to live in the truth. Jesus says in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. In other words, when you have Jesus, you have the Father and you have the way. When you have Jesus, you have the way to the Father. You have the truth and you have the life that comes from the Father when you have Jesus. He is the visible of the invisible. And He became visible at the time that God ordained that everything that He had spoken before through Moses, the Psalms and the prophets could be fulfilled in Jesus. And for example, remember, when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, we read about this in the Gospel of Luke chapter 9, He was there being transformed as He was in prayer, in fellowship with the Heavenly Father. His face became white as the light, and His clothes became white as the sunshine, 
and his, and his glory that he has with the Father in heaven was made manifest on earth. And Moses and Elijah representing the law and the prophets came to speak to him about the death that he was about to accomplish on the cross of Calvary. And then a cloud overshadowed them all. And out of the cloud came this voice of the Father that says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, hear him. And then Jesus, after all of this glory it went back up into heaven, Jesus spoke to Peter, John, and James, who were there with him, and he said, do not tell this to every, anybody what you've seen until after my resurrection. In other words, they can't understand it yet until the Holy Spirit has come. So wait, when the Holy Spirit's come, then he can make these things that cannot be naturally understood understandable. In other words, you need the inward life of the Holy Spirit to understand the things that are invisible. Or as Paul would say to the Corinthian church, what eye has not seen, what ear has not heard, nor what's entered into the heart of man that God has prepared for those who love him has been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit, those things that have been freely given to us by God in Christ. These things can only be spiritually understood. Therefore, those who do not have the Spirit of Christ cannot understand these things. You see, when Peter then writes his letter, he says in 2 Peter chapter 1, he says, we saw his glory with the Father in heaven. We heard the heavenly Father speak to him, you are my son, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He says, and now we have the prophetic scriptures confirmed through the Lord Jesus Christ. And these prophetic scriptures are like a light that helps us be able to see, but otherwise would be difficult to understand. You see, the Holy Spirit helps us to grasp those things that are written for us. The scriptures are written for our com comfort, our exhortation, our discipline and correction, is what Paul says in Timothy. And it's so important today, friends, that we don't just get direction and understanding from the outside, but from the Heavenly Father directly in the inside that the Holy Spirit inwardly begins to unveil to us who He is, who the Father is, and who Jesus is. You see, when Jesus was praying in John 17, He said, Father, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true living God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And that's in verse 3, I think. And then in verse 22, he says, Father, I pray that the same glory, the glory of being one with you that you have given me, that they may also have this same glory, that even as you are in me, I may be in them, so that we may be made perfectly one, so that the world may realize that you sent me and have loved them as much as you have loved me. Father, the world does not know you, but I know you. And these disciples whom you have given me, they know you sent me, for I have revealed you to them, and I will keep on revealing you to them, so that the same love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. I love it where it says in the King Amplifier, it says the same mighty love with which you love me. Oh, dear friends, God so longs for the invisible of His life and love to become visible in you and me. You see, all of God was made visible in Jesus, who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with Him, anointing Him with the Holy Spirit and power. Jesus was, came into the world to help us find, to know the only true living God in Him, in Him. And the same is now true for you and me as the body of Christ, as the temple of God's Holy Spirit. Or don't you know that your body is not your own? It's been bought with a price. Your body is the temple of God's Holy Spirit. 
Oh, it's so wonderful. It's so wonderful to realize that God is pleased to dwell not just with us, but in us. Jesus said on the night before he went to the cross to his disciples in John 14, verse 16, he says, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom I will send you from the Father, he who dwells with you will be in you. And then you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. For as I live, you will live also. And if you love me, then you will do what I say. And you will be loved by my Father and I and my Father will come and make our home with you. Oh, it is so amazingly wonderful when we begin to realize that what is invisible becomes visible in us. Oh, friends, this is more real than you may imagine. Do you know how Moses, when he was on the mountain with God, I think this is in Exodus 34, he came down from the mountain and Moses was not aware that his person was radiating with glory. He wasn't aware of it. In other words, he had been so in intimacy with the Father that he did not notice the difference between himself and the Father. He was made one with the Father. He wasn't aware of the difference. Do you understand this? You see, if you read in Exodus, what is it, chapter 6, when he's at the burning bush and, and the glory of God is revealed to him, it's maybe in a previous chapter there, right at the beginning of Exodus, it, 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 the Lord says, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am, Lord. He said, take the shoes off your feet for the place upon which you stand is holy ground. And Moses was afraid to look upon the burning bush that was burning but not consumed. Oh, how I long to be a, a burning bush today. Oh yes, dear friends. It says in, in, in Matthew 3 verse 11 that Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Oh, how I long to be burning, burning, burning with the light and the life of His glory and presence, that my body is wholly filled and flooded with God Himself, that I'm a living expression of the glory of Jesus at the Father's right hand, that I'm a witness not just in word, but in the deeds of His presence and power. Oh, and this is not just my longing, this to be the longing of all our hearts, of all His church, for we are His body. We are the glory of Him who is exalted at the Father's right hand. We are the glory of Christ. Oh, friends, this is so real. And Moses dared not look upon the face of God, but you could see how after a while, the Lord by His great love removed that fear out of his heart so much so that he was completely one with the Lord and didn't even know it. He didn't know that there was, the oneness was there. In the beginning he knew, oh no, I dare not look, I'm ashamed. And he hid his face in his, in his robe, he hid his face. You know, he dared not look upon the Lord, but then the Lord says, I speak to Moses as a man speaks with his friend face to face. Oh, what a glory, what a glory Moses lived in. And Paul writes to the Corinthian church, if you'll look up with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and he says that glory that Moses was experiencing and his oneness with God was fading. It was fading like a suntan. And therefore Moses put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not see the fading of that glory. And every time Moses would go into the tabernacle to speak to the Lord, he would remove the veil and again be renewed in his glory. And we get a foretaste of what God would give us through the Lord Jesus through these examples. But I want to take you here to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where we learn that the glory that we have is greater than what Moses had because Moses only had it on the outside but we are given it on the inside. Oh yes, the Bible says when anybody turns to Jesus Christ, it's like taking the veil away from Moses' face and we are changed into the same image of Christ from one degree of His glory to another degree of His glory. For where the Spirit of the Lord Jesus is, there's freedom to be transformed into His likeness. That's what he says in chapter 3, verse 18. And then he says here in chapter 4, 
verse 6, for this God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, that glory that was shining from the face of Jesus, the glory of God, he has commanded to shine in our hearts. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of ourselves. It may seem a little bit difficult to grasp in the beginning, but as you meditate upon this, oh my friends, it becomes so wonderful, so absolutely overwhelmingly wonderful that the glory that is given to us through our communion and union with Jesus is that the light of God's life is commanded to shine in our hearts, in our inward parts, that we are inwardly filled with the light of the life of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us and that by that life we now live a new life, a heavenly life, a holy life, a sinless life. And we are made acceptable and well-pleasing to the Father. Oh, this is so absolutely wonderful where you begin through that glory inwardly, you begin to pray prayers that you may have never, never prayed before. Maybe you used to pray, oh Lord, why do I feel cut off? Or why do I feel separated? Or why do I feel unworthy? Or why do I feel, oh please, Lord, change me, fix me. And I understand that prayer because I prayed it plenty myself. But as that glory begins to shine inwardly, you begin to pray a different prayer. You say, Father, not unto us, Psalm 115, not unto us, Lord, but to your own name, to your own glory, give glory, to your own presence, to your own, to your own image, give glory. In other words, we seek not our own glory, but we seek the Father's glory through his glory inwardly. We begin, begin to long for the Father to be glorified in us. And how does the Father answer such prayer? For you to become the visible of the invisible by renewing you inwardly, daily. Let me read you here 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16 since we're right here. Therefore do not lose heart even though your outward man, your human nature, your body is perishing, yet the inward man, that's the heavenly man, it's the life of Christ in you, is being renewed day by day. And then he talks about how living in this body here on earth that we suffer some afflictions. He says, for our light afflictions, which are but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Wow, we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see that life that's invisible is eternal. I love that scripture in Revelations 1 verse 18, where Jesus says in the Amplified Translation, I now live in the eternity of eternities. I now dwell in the eternity of eternities. I mean, that is one of the greatest attributes of God's nature, eternal is one of his great attributes. It's not something that maybe we are as busy with as we should. When Jesus said, God so loved the world that we should not perish, but have eternal life, eternal. And in verse 36 of John 3, he says, you now have eternal life if you have, have faith in me. Oh, it is so wonderful, friends, when you begin to realize that this life that you have inwardly, that he renews inwardly for his own glory to be manifest, for his own majesty to be manifest, he renews in you inwardly, daily. Daily you're being renewed in the inward man. Daily he makes you new. So in closing, let's read Colossians chapter 3. I'll read it to you from the Amplified Translation. Oh, I love these verses. These are so good to meditate on. 
If then you have been raised with Christ to a new life, sharing his resurrection from the dead, aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds and keep them set on the things which are above the higher things and not on the things that are here on the earth. For as far as this world is concerned, you have died and your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Oh, I'd love to talk to you about this, but let me go ahead and, and say that last part. Christ at the Father's right hand is ever living to intercede for us, to give us his life, the life he has with and in the Father. He gives us that life through the Holy Spirit consistently. That's being renewed in the inward man daily, yes? And we have, so to speak, by the Holy Spirit, a down payment of this which is called our inheritance, the fullness of his life. It's the joy and the glory that was set before him that what he has with the Father, he would be able to share with you and me who receive him. To as many as receive him, to them he gives the, the authority or the power of right to become sons and daughters of God, John writes in his first chapter of John. And, and, and he is giving us that life and we now have this life in this earthen vessel so that it is obvious that the glory of this life is not ours. It comes from the Father in heaven that we are children of God, that we are saints of God. In the New, in the New Testament, we're called saints. Oh, I love this. Saints, we're heavenly beings. We're born from above. We live from above. We're fed with the life of the Son of God through His Holy Spirit. We are renewed inwardly daily. Yes? And my dear friends, when He comes and appears and the glory of His life shines forth upon His glory in you and me in the twinkling of an eye, we are made perfect in His likeness as by the greatness of his glory, he subdues our natural body to be conformed to his heavenly body. Uh, uh, Paul teaches in Philippians chapter one. And our lowly body is conformed to his heavenly body. Our earthly perishing body take on the heavenly body. That's why he continues then in chapter five, he says, oh God, I so long to be fully clothed with who I am in heaven. Not that I want to be a bodiless spirit. No, I want to be fully clothed, fully manifest in who I am in heaven. You see right now, this is my closing here. Right now, because we still live in this Adamic body, the body of Adam, right? This earthly body, the body of dust, a flesh that will not will not inherit this glory. Now we'll put this body off and we get a new body that the Lord has prepared. Because we're still in this body, it's not visible yet what we shall be in all of its fullness. It's still invisible what we shall be, right? And it says here, but now, beloved, how great is the love of the Heavenly Father despite that we are still human and earthly, we are already called children of God even though it's not visible yet what we shall be in this fullness of God. But when Christ comes, then we will become visible in who we are in heaven. Then it becomes visible. Oh, my dear friends, right now, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, it's like looking dimly at an image that is not fully manifest yet. It's not totally clear yet. In other words, you can meet believers and you can go, my goodness, I feel the presence and the glory of the Lord, but they're still so human. They're still so human. And I would so t want to talk to you about this because many times we look at people from a human perspective. All we see about them is what's natural. And yes, maybe we see their earthly struggle. Maybe we see their wrestling of the flesh that wrestles against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, according to Galatians 5. And maybe that's what you see. And then what do you believe about them? 
wow, well, they're not really or them. Um, when Samuel looked at, at David's oldest brother, he said, surely the anointed of the Lord's before me. And the Lord said to Samuel, Samuel, I don't look at people from the outward appearance. I look at people from the heart. He's not the one. And then when David came forth, he was the one. You see, God knows you inwardly, where His life dwells inside of you. And He wants that which is invisible to become visible. And this is my prayer for you, that maybe you are still so hidden as a Christian, but the Lord says, come and abide in me as I, as my living word abides in you and the fruit will begin to manifest that that which is invisible will become more and more visible and that people could see that you're not just a mere human being. You're born of God. You're a new creation. Some of those old passions, some of those old methods, some of those old ways, some of those ways of talking and acting, they're gone. They're swallowed up by the life of the Son of God. They're buried in His death on the cross. And what's now made manifest in you is the new life, the heavenly life, the holy life, the sinless life, the righteousness of God in Christ that is perfectly righteous and perfectly full of peace and joy. Oh, this life is what God longs to be made manifest in you and me today. Jesus said in Matthew 5, let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And if you're watching me today and you say, Pastor Robert, I don't have this life in me. I'm dead inside. Or maybe you've fallen away, you've turned your back and you've given over to the passions of your flesh. The scripture says in Galatians 6 that when you sow to the desires of your flesh, you'll spiritually die. But if you sow to what the Holy Spirit wants, you'll live and experience the peace with God. And maybe you say, oh, I don't have any peace and I've spiritually really kind of died. Jesus said in Luke 15, my son who was dead is alive and he who was lost is found in my presence again. If you say, I want to be found to God again. I want to be spiritually alive again. Put your hand on your heart and let's pray this simple little prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus, I repent of all my sins and I ask you to forgive me. Cleanse me with your precious blood. Create in me a clean heart and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Amen, amen. I'd love to connect with you, especially if you've prayed that prayer for the first time, but maybe you've recommitted your life to Christ. Why don't you take a moment and text the word CONNECT to double six triple seven, and one of the pastors here will get in contact with you. I'd love to send you the little Gospel of John. It's 21 beautiful chapters, as well as a little booklet of what it means to be a Christian. It's free of charge, without strings attached. We'd just like to connect with you. So take a moment and text the word CONNECT to double six and triple seven. On these Wednesdays, we always honor the Lord with our giving. And if you would like to join in with us and do that, and I would be so happy that you would put the Lord first in your giving and you can see the instructions on, uh, on the screen or just go online to lifechurchuk.org and, and there will be instructions how you can do it. But honor the Lord with your giving. Keep Him first place in your life and you will see His blessings will overtake you. In Jesus' name, I bless you. And I trust to see you on the daily devotions or on the Sunday services. We're meeting again here on the Wednesday evenings at church and as well as on Sunday mornings with full children's ministry. So if you're in our area, be sure to join us. We love you. Have a good day. God bless.